Good morning. I fully expect to not get done with my lesson today, but we will, uh, uh, that's okay. I put a cutoff point in the middle of the sermon just in case, because I, I know I can just start talking. So we'll, uh, we'll try to be mindful of the time and, and uh, mindful of the message at the same time. So see, see where we get. Up in Pinson, I, I don't know how it is everywhere else because I don't spend a lot of time everywhere else, but up in our Pinson clay area, there are times when, just occasionally, there will be a pack of stray dogs that are just wandering down the street. Uh, as far as I can tell, they're not causing any trouble, but they're just a different assortment of dogs who have decided they like to hang out together and they travel in this pack and they all look dirty and a little bit gross and a little bit underfed and none of them are wearing collars and they just happen to wander around together. I don't know where they go at night. I don't know what they do. Uh, but I, every time I see them, I feel a little bit sorry. Uh, I, I've, my, my heart goes out to those dogs and I kind of want to take them in. My children would gladly let me. I don't know that my wife would be in agreement with that. Uh, so those dogs continue to wander around as stray animals. And I imagine probably most of us have seen that. We've seen those stray dogs that live on the streets, live in the alleyways, wander through the woods, and we probably have all had those same uh, connections to them, where we, they're either such a nuisance, we want to figure out what to do about them, or our heart goes out to them and we, we want to take them in. We, me and you, are strays. I was thinking about this this week and thinking about it particularly in the context of how do we deal with people that are different than us, who have chosen a different pathway than us, who have chosen a life of sin or a life without God, whereas we have chosen a life with God. And how should we treat those people? How, how should we feel toward those people? How should we handle their questions or their objections or their arguments that they might throw at us? And I think we should treat them like strays. And hopefully you'll know what I mean by the time I get done this morning. The truth is, we're all strays. We all begin with God, and the Bible's fairly clear about that. Uh, you've got passages like Romans chapter 7, which talk about the unimputed sin of Paul, or to put that in probably simpler terms, the sins what he had committed but he wasn't being held guilty for. Sins that it seems he committed before he was really responsible to the law, before he was being judged by the law, he had done things that were wrong, but those things weren't imputed to him, seemingly uh, a reference to his young age. Even Jesus himself talked about becoming like children, as if children had a special connection to God. And we have all come to the conclusion that children, before they come to what we have titled the age of accountability, they are right with God. They're safe. I, I like to qualify people in one of three categories. You're either lost, saved, or safe. And there are some people who are safe. Children are safe because they've begun with God. But at some point in their story, they run away from God and become strays. Lots of verses talk about this. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 talk about our sins have separated us from our God and created a gulf between us and him. Romans 3, 23 says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. We're separated from God. We become at some point in our story, disconnected from the God we began with. At some point in our story, while we used to live in the home of God, in a sense, we used to live in the comfort of God's protection, the comfort of God's 
acceptance. At some point, we reject that and we run away from God and we go to live on our own, do our own thing, our own way, the way we want to live. That's what we do. And we find ourselves like a bedraggled, malnourished dog wandering on the street. We find ourselves strayed. And we end up with the choice of whether we go home to God or whether we're going to stay distant. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people who choose to stay stay distant from him. Now, what's interesting about those people who never come back to God, who don't pursue God, who don't go after God's way, those people still seek fulfillment. They still want to have a fulfilled and full life. They still want to have the joys that come from knowing they have purpose, knowing they matter. They still look for acceptance in a community. That's why I find it interesting that dogs often are strayed in packs, not on their own even though it would make sense for them to be on their own because, hey, if there's food, then they get all of it. They won't. They travel in packs. And and people do the same thing. When we've lost our God, we've lost that, that place where we belong, we look for a place of belonging. We look for a community that we can be a part of. We look for acceptance among people who are like us. We seek after joy and enjoyment and pleasure. We seek after the things that that we want to do, the things that bring us a smile on our face. Those are the things we pursue. We seek after some sort of purpose, some ideal that we can can achieve, some, some bigger thing than us that we can go after. Those who stay away from God still look to succeed. It's not that they've given up on life. It's not that they've given up on on having any sort of good thing. They still want good things, but they want good things their terms. They want to be able to define what's good and what's bad, and they want to be able to choose whether they're whatever it is they want to choose. And they do all that based on their purpose. Many seek escape. Many strays, many of those who have, who have walked away from God still uh, get themselves backed into a corner in such a way that they, they realize they need to get away from that. But once you've been gone from God long enough, it's hard to find. It's hard to trust again. It's hard to know where you can go and find safety and comfort and provision. So, they keep looking. And if truth is told, fulfillment is often found based on whatever is sought after. I I think we do a disservice sometimes when we think about the world and we compare the world to the church and we act like the church is the only place where people can be happy. It's not true. I've heard people say, you know, it's only in the church that marriages can truly be joyful marriages. I I know plenty of non-Christians who have great marriages. They feel like only in the church will you be able to find something to truly have joy about. That's just not true. The truth is God has placed a lot of joyful things in the world for his creation to enjoy. What is it that Jesus says? He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. We're experiencing the same world. And just like we can find fulfillment and happiness and laughter and good things in this world, so can those without God. It just depends on what you're looking for. 
And many of those people, they find communities that are ready to accept them as they are. Even communities built around sinful activities, you can find community. And there are communities for everything now. It cracked me up that there was a lady in Memphis that I was good friends with. She was a Christian. And she had, before becoming a Christian, she had gotten involved in what was called the Camaro Club. She had bought a Camaro just so that she could be a part of the Camaro Club. She hated her Camaro. Hated it. Hated the car payment she was paying. There were so many things wrong with that car that she didn't enjoy, but she was part of the Camaro Club. And the Camaro Club was a place where people got together and they would talk about their cars and they would have a, a beer or wine or whatever together and they would meet once a week and it was a community that she could be involved in and she so, so desired to be a part of a community that she bought a car she didn't like so that she could be a part of that community. You ever seen bikers riding together? You heard them before you saw them, right? That's normally the way it goes. Why do they all ride together? The community. There are religious communities. There are communities based on sexual orientation. Communities based on hobbies and entertainment and possessions and whatever it is. There are communities out there ready to accept you. So if you're looking for community and you're astray, you find your community. There are temporary joys everywhere in this world. Now notice, I say temporary joys. I don't even mean fleeting joys like it only lasts for a moment. It might be a joy that lasts for a lifetime. But that's still temporary. And so for those who are looking for joy and enjoyment and pleasurable things, this world is full of that. We like to kid ourselves that it's not, but the truth is, if sin wasn't enjoyable, we wouldn't do it. That's why it's tempting. And so there are plenty of places you can go in this world to find temporary joys. Purpose has been redefined for many people. People find escape in drugs and alcohol and blaming other people. I would even say in activism. I know that sounds weird, but you know how many people find their purpose and find a sense of escape from the from day-to-day -day life by being involved in some sort of activism, some bigger thing than themselves, some great purpose they've given themselves, and so they become this activist for this cause because it's something they can identify with. It's something they can escape the monotonousness of everyday life in order to find something to be a part of. Well, here's the problem. We, who have come back to God, realize there's a better way. And the question I was asked a year ago that I'm just now getting around to preaching is this. How do I teach my friend who has chosen this other way of living, whether that be homosexuality, whether it be some sort of sexual orientation, whether it be some life of partying, whatever the sin is, whatever the, the lifestyle is, how do I teach that friend of mine what the scriptures say, what the truth is? And I'm going to tell you, I think in a lot of ways we've gone about that the wrong way over the years. What we have tried to do is we've tried to show people that the only place to find fulfillment and joy and pleasure and community is in the church, is in the gospel, is in the kingdom. But not true. And when we go out there and we talk that way, we sound like idiots. We sound like we don't know what we're talking about, or we sound dishonest as if we're making stuff up that they know isn't true. It's not the right way to do this. 
The truth is, God has basically said, the door is open whenever you're ready to walk through it. And that's where God leads it. There's a lot of people in this world who are looking for things and finding things and finding ways to find fulfillment and ways to fit in and all of those types of things. And they're ultimately going to realize that those things aren't getting them anywhere. But the problem is most of those people don't know that there is somewhere else to go. Because those of us who have walked through the door of salvation don't tell anyone about it. I love these passages that talk about like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For he who has asked has received and he who seeks finds and he who knocks, the door has been opened for them. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 talks about Jesus standing, knocking at the door. That he's there, uh, just, just knocking on the door, waiting on somebody to open that door. And that, he's knocking on everyone's door. The question is, are they willing to walk through it? Well, we're going to talk about what will, what will help that in a moment. And, but I, I do want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I want to read verse 9 through 11. We're familiar with the passage, but I, I want you to really key in on a part of this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, no idolaters, no adulterers, no males who have sex with males, no thieves, no greedy people, no drunkards, no verbally abusive people, nor swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. Now that's the first problem. So we got a world of people out there who are pursuing self. They're strays. They've walked away from their they've walked away from the table where they're getting fed. They've walked away from their home of safety and security. They've walked away from a master who loves them and cares for them and treats them with compassion. They've walked away from all of that. They've run away, and now they're strays. And depending on how long they've been strays, they might not know that that master exists anymore. They don't know that there's a door wide open for them waiting on them to come home. And if they stay out there, they're lost. They're lost. They have no hope. They have nothing. And while they might find a scrap of bread or meat that brings them pleasure, and they might find a small community of other dogs that they can run around with, and they might find a, a, a place of, of warmth and safety out there in the woods, back in the rock somewhere in a hole. They might find little bits of pleasure and fulfillment and protection and provision. They might find little bits of it. Does that compare to the safety and warmth and provision of the master's house? Not at all. But if that's all they know, that's all they've ever experienced, and what they have experienced from people is that people kick at them and people despise them and people don't want to have anything to do with them, are they ever going to look for something better? No. No. second part of this passage, verse 11, some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That door is open for everyone. And I think we forget that sometimes. I think we forget there are people out there that do not know there's a better way. 
And there are too many people out there who aren't aware that the door is ready to be opened and that Jesus is knocking on the door saying, hey, won't you come in? Won't you let me in? Won't you build a relationship with me? And Jesus is so clear about this. We're not going to look at these first three, but they're all there in Luke chapter 15. And you're familiar with the story. The lost sheep. When the shepherd goes out, he boxes in his 99 sheep, and he goes out and he searches for the one sheep. And when he finds the one sheep, he brings the one sheep back home. He is joyful because he has found the lost sheep. And the woman who found her lost coin, how joyful she is, and how very applicable the story of the prodigal son or the lost son is to what we're talking about today. A boy who left home, ran away, went and lived his own way, and then decided that wasn't good anymore, and he decided to come home. I want you to turn with me over to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. The story here has always fascinated me. And it has always kind of slapped me in the face a little bit. Look with me here, Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table, and a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with the perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him in saw this, he said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who's touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Say it, teacher, he said. Creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. Which one of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You've judged correctly, Jesus told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she's anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loves much. But the one who has forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Isn't that a beautiful story? I mean, did you really pay attention to the details of the story? That here's a, a Pharisee who is so disgusted by a sinner. Now I want you to note something. The sinner in his house, he's disgusted by her, at least publicly. And he looks down his nose at her. He doesn't want to have anything to do with her. And he uses her as a catalyst for criticizing and condemning Jesus. If he really were a prophet, he would know this woman shouldn't be anywhere near him. He showed his ignorance and his own hypocrisy in saying that. He showed hypocrisy because here's a woman who, who's in his house. He didn't complain about that. He just used her to complain about Jesus. He showed his ignorance because he has clearly not a clue what Jesus' teachings and gospel is really about. He doesn't understand the teaching of forgiveness. And I love that Jesus' parallel there showed just how greatly what she did diminished what Simon the Pharisee had done. Simon couldn't be bothered to wash or to give Jesus water 
for his feet, but here this woman gave her tears and did the washing for him. And Simon couldn't be bothered to greet Jesus with a holy kiss, but here this woman hadn't quit kissing his feet since he came in. And Simon couldn't be bothered to to anoint his head with olive oil, a, a very common substance, but here this woman used a very costly substance on his feet because she loved much. Truth is, I think the way that we handle the world looked a lot more like this Pharisee than like this woman. I think the way we handle the world sometimes looks a lot more like the condemning words and the hypocrisy and the ignorance of this Pharisee than we want to admit. We can turn up our nose at those nasty, malnourished, skinny strays. They're different than us. They're gross. They're unloved. We don't want to have anything to do with them. We don't want to have to be bothered. We don't want to have to deal with all the baggage and difficulties that come with helping somebody who, who has suffered so much without God. There's a story that was written down from back in World War II. It was a Christian man living in one of the countries over there uh, where there were concentration camps and such. And he, he wrote this. He said, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. I attended church since I was a small boy, and we had heard the stories of what was happening to the Jews. But like most people today in this country, we tried to distance ourselves from the reality of what was really taking place. What could anyone do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning we would hear the whistle from the distance and then the clacking of the wheels moving along the track. We became disturbed when one Sunday we noticed cries coming from the train as it passed by. We grimly realized that the train was carrying Jews, and they were like cattle in those cars. Week after week that train whistle would blow. We would dread to hear the sounds of those old wheels because we knew that the Jews would begin to cry as they passed by our church. It was terribly disturbing. We could do nothing to help those poor, miserable people, yet their screams tormented us. We knew exactly at what time the whistle would blow, so we decided the only way to keep from being disturbed by the cries was to start singing our hymns. By the time the train came rumbling past the churchyard. We were singing at the top of our voices. If some of the screams reached our ears, we'd just sing a little louder until we could hear them no more. Years passed, and no one talks about it much anymore, but I still hear the train whistle in my sleep. I can still hear them crying out for help. God forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians, yet did nothing to intervene. Is that us? Is that us sitting in padded pews, nice air-conditioned auditoriums, singing a little louder so that we don't hear the cries of those suffering around us? Before I've told you about the words of Penn Jillette, He's the part of the Penn and Teller magician team that does their show in Las Vegas. He is a, he is a well-known and outspoken atheist that after one of his shows, one of the audience members came up to him because they always greet audience members afterwards and handed him a Bible and said, hey, if you're ever interested, I'd love to study with you. And Penn has come out and said, you know, it's the first time that's ever happened in the years of us doing our show. He says, you know, people think I'd be offended by that. He goes, I wasn't. He says, I was honored. He says, now I don't believe what that man believes. He says, but at least that man believed it enough to care about my soul. Because what kind of heaven and hell and God do you believe in if you're willing to let people go to hell 
all because you didn't want to say anything. You know, we can't as Christians look at all those malnourished dogs around us, those unloved animals, and turn our nose up or we can receive them, love them, and clean them up, and teach them that there's a better way and a more hopeful way and a way that leads to, to truly being loved. Not holes in the ground where you can find warmth and not spare pieces of trash where you can find nourishment, but a table with a king who loves you and provides for you and receives you and accepts you. And the reason I'm using the illustration of strays is this. It's not because I want us to look at the world around us and think of them as dogs. That, that's not my point at all. But because there's a certain process you have to go through when you want to love a stray back to being a pet. And it begins with displaying to that stray what it means to be loved. That, that's part of it you got to display what it means to be loved, which means we need to be talking about how loved we are. And we need to be displaying to the world about how loved we are and what all God has done for us. We need to openly enjoy the fellowship and the community that we're a part of. Uh, it's amazing to me to hear Christians complain about their local fellowship to the world. Why would we do that? Why would we complain about the people of God that we associate with if we want the people who don't yet belong to God to want to come and associate with us? It doesn't make any sense. Yet so often we, we don't enjoy our fellowship and our community. We come only on Sunday morning because that's all we can be bothered with and that's all we have to do. Why? Why would that be our, our perspective? If we truly belong and enjoy belonging to God, why wouldn't we want to be with God's people? Why wouldn't we openly enjoy that? Why wouldn't we want to have that kind of community together more often, not less often? We'd be ready to open those doors whenever we see wanting and whimpering. Every single one of us, every single week, gets opportunities to share truth with somebody. I don't care if you work a full-time job. That's probably the easiest way. But even those of us, we have, we're connected these days like we have never been connected before. There's all the social media stuff. We've got telephones and have for decades in which we call people and talk to them. We've got email now, texting. There are so many ways in which we are connected to people. And I guarantee you every single one of us hears something every week that we can use to turn into something for God's glory. All of us do problem is not opportunities for most of us, it's willingness. We hear whimpering around us all the time where there are people who realize life isn't as good as it could be. And we are the ones sitting on the answers. We've got a whole back pocket full of treats ready to hand out to the world and we refuse to throw them out there. And then we got to realize that with strays comes baggage. I don't know if you've ever done the process of bringing in a stray. I, I remember doing this as a kid. I've not done it since I was an adult. But I remember doing this as a kid. And it is amazing how skittish and standoffish that stray will be for a while. 
They, they don't. You reach out your hand, they do that. They're used to being kicked at and swatted at and unloved and beaten down. and They don't trust anyone or anything because they've lived a life that has caused them to not trust anyone or anything. And it takes a while to love a stray back to a level of trust that you can build a relationship with them. And then it takes a while to get them past some of their difficulties. The same is true of people. When you have people who have been deserted, they've been betrayed, they've been mistreated, they've been abused, they have suffered through sin, they've suffered through a life of abuse and difficulty, they don't trust you. You want to know why they don't want to hear the gospel from you? Because they don't trust you. But if you can get them to trust you, then the door will open for the gospel. We need to be living in a way that helps people learn to trust us. And, and, and I, I don't know how to say that other than that means we just need to get out there and love people. Quit criticizing, quit condemning, quit judging, quit making bold and ugly statements about people and people groups, even people and people groups you disagree with. Love people. God does. God even loves the people he disagrees with. God even loves the people who have personally offended him. Shouldn't we? And I don't care what the sin or the offense is. Love homosexual people. Love people that have chosen alternative sexual orientation. Love people who have given themselves over to a society that, that permits anything and everything. Love the murderers. Love the perjurers. Love the adulterers. Love the fornicators. Love all of them. That doesn't mean you have to agree with them means you love them. And when they truly know that you love them, then they will learn to listen. And but don't start preaching at them before you love them. It's not going to get you anywhere. That's not going to help anyone or anything. You've got to love them. And once you've loved them long enough, you have petted, you know, going back to the illustration of, the, of a stray, you've loved them enough that they're willing to come over and lay down at your feet and they're willing to be petted by you they trust you when you get that first time when that dog's willing to roll over on his back and expose his belly to you then you can start having a relationship with that dog and there's a sense in which that's true with people too people aren't going to be vulnerable with you until they trust you and they aren't going to trust you until they know that you love them. You've got to start with loving them. You've got to start with, with building that relationship in a way that brings them home. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5-11. through 11. Now the goal of our instruction is love. Notice that's the first thing. The goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience and a sincere faith. Now listen to the rest of the context of this passage. Some have departed from these and turned aside to fruitless discussion. They want to be teachers of the law, although they don't understand what they are saying or what they are insisting on. But we know that the law is good, provided one uses it legitimately. Some versions say lawfully now he explains what that is we know that the law is not meant for the righteous person but for the lawless the rebellious for the ungodly and the sinful for the unholy and the irreverent for those who kill their fathers and mothers for murderers for the sexually immoral and males who have sex with males, for slave traders, liars, perjurers, for whatever else is contrary to sound teaching that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of our blessed God which is entrusted to me. 
Did you get that? The law has a purpose. And if we're not using it for that purpose, we are illegitimately handling the word of God. We talk all the time about rightly dividing the word of truth, don't we? The way to rightly divide the word of truth is to share it with the irreverent, with the murderer, with the homosexual, with the sinner. That's the way to use it. And we have this habit of spending all of our time gathering together, learning and discussing and growing, and we argue about the finer points of the law, and we have all of these discussions about the way all of the timelines fit together, and is this the right application? What about the authority of Scripture in this case? And what rules do we apply to this act of worship? And we have all of these discussions that, I'll be honest, sometimes are more fruitless than productive. And we do all of that to the absence of taking the law to the murderer and the homosexual and the sinner and our neighbor and our co-worker and our family. And I'm afraid we're going to get to heaven one day and God's going to say, hey, it's not going to be a test an academic test of how many stories you know. It's going to be a test of how did you use the law for his purpose. Did we? We don't take the law to the people who it was intended to help, and we have, because of that, used it unlawfully. Our command in Scripture is to take the law to those for whom it is intended. The lawless, the rebellious, the murderers, the slave traitors, some of your versions even say. That's where we take the law. Are we doing that? Is that how we've used it? Do we have a history and a lifetime that looks like people who have gone out there and shared the gospel with strays? I mean, I'll be honest. This congregation should not look like a pristine congregation full of people who have it all together, but it should look like a congregation full of people who are trying to pull it together. That's what God's church is supposed to look like. if we're taking in strays. It's hard. It's a lot of work. And it's uncomfortable work. You know, the truth is, you reach out for that stray the first time, you run the risk of getting bit. You reach out to love on that stray the first few times, you're probably going to do a lot of work trying to get them to trust you. But when they finally do, like Jesus' story of that woman with the perfume, they are loyal, they are loving, and they love much because they've been forgiven much. How do you handle somebody who has a different lifestyle than you? How do you handle somebody who has given themselves to a homosexual lifestyle and talked to them about the truth? You don't. Not at first. First you love them. Then you teach them. And if you get that out of order, you'll never get anywhere with them. How, how do you love that murderer who's in jail or who has recently gotten out? We've, we've worshipped with a murderer before. Somebody who spent 12 years in jail because of murder. And, and I'll be honest, I, I was a little bit floored at just at that congregation, even though it was well known how accepting everybody was of this, this person. Was willing to love on them, was willing to accept them into the mist. I don't know that that would happen in a lot of congregations. 
You find out about the 20 years of jail time, and we, we have way too many questions to make them comfortable. I'm not saying we shouldn't be informed, but I am saying that that person should feel loved. And if it's a homosexual person, what do we do that first time? Because it will happen at some point where there's a couple that walks in here willing to, and, and ready and expecting to be accepted for the way that they're living, and, and we have to have those conversations with them. What do we do about that person who has, who has had surgery to change themselves in a way that matches what society says they should do, and now they're, they're struggling with what to do next? How do we handle that? In every single scenario, the answer is the same. We love them, and then we teach them. And until we can learn to love them first, we need to be careful about what we're teaching. Because we could do so much harm in turning them away from the cause of Christ by coming across as judgmental and condemning and ugly and rude and hateful if we don't build that relationship of trust first. I hope down the road that, that we look like a congregation of strays then we're doing the Lord's work and we're doing it the way he's commanded us to do it and we will have a relationship with people that we never thought we'd have relationships with because because they love the Lord the same way we do and they serve a savior who saved them the same way he saved us and we can all be redeemed and go to heaven together if you're not a child of God, today is a great day to become a child of God. I, I don't care what you've done in your past. I, I don't care if, if you've struggled with, uh, with, with what we would consider minor sins or major sins. They're all sins. They're all pardonable. They're all redeemable. They're all forgivable if we'll just give them to the cross. And that comes from repenting of a life without him and being baptized into Christ through him, so that we can one day join him in heaven. If you need the invitation to get your life right and become a child of God, to be baptized into Christ, we want you to come forward. Let us know how we can help as we stand and sing this song.